that again. We will sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you hear us when we shout. this evening.
Pastor Kim is on spring break along with many of our kids, but I believe we have. Are you doing sermon sack as well? All right, Pastor Paul's got it covered. So kids, come on down, meet Pastor Paul for sermon and sack. boys and girls, and not as many of you, but my, what a good-looking group you are, and you're the really smart ones, aren't you? Yeah, you're, now, uh, you know, usually one of you brings the, the sack with the story, and Pastor Kim doesn't know what you have in your sack. I have the advantage, I've got the sack, so I was able to put the, the uh, suggestions in the sack. So I know what it's all about, but it's your job to guess. And so the first thing I've pulled out of my sack is a coin. One coin. Can any of you guess what a Bible story about a coin, Caden? About the Good Samaritan. Uh-huh. Well, that's, not, that's a good story, but that's not it. Right. The tax collector. You mean Zacchaeus, maybe? Or Levi? Levi was Matthew. He was a tax collector, but that's not what this coin's about. Austin? All right. Uh, that's a great story, Austin. The widow that didn't have but two mites and put in her little two pennies. That's all she had, and she gave them all to Jesus. But that was not all of it. That's not the one that I'm talking about tonight. Let me get another item. Now, what do you think? Caden? Of the people that were hungry and Jesus fed the, took the fish and the bread from the little boy. That's a wonderful story, but that's not it. Austin? When Jesus bought lunch, well, that's, that's a good story. Jesus provided for them by a miracle. But we've got another story. That we have a coin and a fish. Any other suggestions? Do any of the adults know what story that might be? Coin in the mouth of the fish. All right, sounds like Brother Charles Kolaw had it all figured out. The, in Jesus' day, every male Jew, every man Jew, had to pay a temple tax. That was how they maintained the temple. And the temple tax, to put it into our uh, money would be like two quarters. Each man had to pay two quarters every year as a temple tax. 
And Jesus normally paid his temple tax. But one year, Jesus and the disciples had been out uh, several days, several weeks. They'd been out on the Sea of Galilee and back and forth. And they came to Capernaum. And that's where Peter lived. And uh, Jesus was staying at Peter's house in Capernaum. And the uh, tax collector for the temple came to Peter and said, uh, Does your master pay tax? And Peter really didn't know what to answer him, so he went home to talk to Jesus. And when he walked in, before he could say anything, Jesus said, Well, Peter, what do you think? Who pays taxes, the king and his family or strangers, other people? And Peter said, Well, it's not the king and his family. It's others. It's the strangers. And Jesus said, Yes, you're right. And we really shouldn't have to pay temple tax, but so that they will not be offended and talk badly about us, we'll pay the, the tax. But the problem was Peter and Jesus didn't have any money. And so Jesus told Peter, you go and out and take your line, throw out your line, and the first fish you catch will have a coin in its mouth. And so it would have the coin, and the coin was sufficient to pay Jesus' tax and Peter's tax. So it was like they had two, four coins that made a dollar. And this coin's a dollar. Have you ever seen a dollar coin like that? Yeah, you know what it is. It's a, it's a grass-colored coin. So Jesus had a fish all prepared. And when Peter got there, he found the money to pay the tax, and the tax was paid. Isn't it marvelous that Jesus supplies our needs and takes care of us? Okay, let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, we thank you for the stories we read in the Bible. We thank you because we know they are true. We thank you because you love us. We pray that you would help us to love you. Help us to serve you. Help us to obey our parents. Help us to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Aiden, uh, Aiden you want to help? And Austin, if the two of you would take the candy and distribute. Well, I had the advantage on the kids tonight, and uh, I wanted to, something to try to really stir them. And Matthew chapter 17, the verses 27 and following is that story if you want to read it. Interesting story. But now we want to have some prayer requests and prayer to pray together. First of all, we have a praise. We just learned uh, this afternoon that we have our fourth great-grandchild. Eli Robert Troutman was born this morning, nine-something, and a good-sized boy, eight pounds and something, and 20 inches long, so he, he's got a good start on his great-grandpa. Uh, prayer request, or if there's another praise, we'd be glad to hear that, too. Praise, request, and prayer. If you'll speak up and try to make it one, one sentence so I can hear it and repeat it. So those who are watching online can know what the requests are. Yes, Sherry. All right. Sherry's praising the Lord for the good time that they had on their cruise. Anyone else have a praise or 
prayer request. Thank you, uh, Brother Delon. Delon, I request or praise the Lord for the uh, way he's gotten along and for the way people have supported him uh, during this uh, weeks and months of uh, recuperation from a fall, and we're glad that he's able to be back in church. His request was for, the, for our nation, for America, and we do need to pray for America tonight. And we will do that. Any other requests? Yes, Aiden. Do you want to thank the Lord for your dad's surgery and that he got through that good? Thank you. All right, Amy's Amy Woods' father has our good friend has good friend's father has prostate cancer, so we want to remember this one. All right. Hey. Ashley says there's a close friend of theirs that just found they had cancer. We almost always have a number of physical requests, and that's fine. We ought to pray for the physical needs of one another. But one of the things that sometimes bothers me, Wednesday night we always take time for prayer requests, and it's very seldom that anyone says, well, I have a friend that really needs the Lord, or I'm visiting with a neighbor that is interested in we need to remember those that are lost about us and do something about it, not putting, putting feet to our prayers, not only praying for them, which we should do, but then doing what we can to bring them to Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come this evening, we want to thank you for little Eli, Eli Robert that was born this today. We want to thank you for Sherry and Arnie having a good time on their cruise. Thank you for the way you've been with Delon and his recuperation from his fall. Thank you that you were with Pastor Brett, and he is doing well today, and we thank you for that. Then, Lord, there are the, the needs that uh, Amy's friend's father that has cancer and Ashley's close friend that has cancer. There are many needs about us, and... Uh, Perhaps there's others that I don't recall at the moment. But we do want to pray for America tonight, how our nation needs you. And we realize that if the Christians don't pray, things are not going to get any better. And sometimes we're tempted to say, well, all I can do is pray. But do we really remember, Lord, how important our prayer is, that you do answer prayer, that you hear the, the prayers of the saints. We pray that you would help us as we reach out not only to our friends and neighbors but to our world today, that somehow you could get hold of hearts and men and women could come to know you and find you as their Savior. So we pray, Lord, that you would help our church to be known as a church that reaches out that brings men and women so that they can be transformed by your grace. We thank you for your love, for your presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now it's time to receive our offering, and uh, we have some ushers that are preparing, and they're coming down, and we've got a If you all will come right on down here and stand at the front, and then we will have prayer, and then you, you can receive the offering. Whoop. Come right, Aiden. Thank you for those. Please help those that are in the hospital. Please help 
Those that are gone today at church, amen. 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 Well, this evening we want to give you guys an opportunity uh, to sing maybe some of those hymns that uh, you haven't heard in a while. So grab one of those hymnals out of the rack in front of you. Find, a, find one that you'd like to sing tonight and give it a shout out. 442. <clears throat> 442, Blessed Assurance. We'll sing the first and last verse. Blessed Assurance. Victory in Jesus, verses 1 and 3, number 352.
475. Deeper, deeper. Number 475. Not the letter O, the number zero, nine. 109, our great savior. Pastor Steve has a great message, uh, so I don't want to take up too much of his time, but I think it would be appropriate to sing number 84 before he comes. Grace greater than our sin. Would that work, uh, Steve? All right, number 84. Grace greater than our sin, verses 1 and 4.
Well, I cut my spiritual teeth on a lot of those songs back in the early and mid-70s, and so I um, brought back a lot, of, a lot of memories. You know, there are some words and concepts that seem to be unique to the church and um, to Christians. One of those words um, is the word grace. Uh, we sang a song earlier in the service um, about grace, and Pastor Paul, in his prayer, um, mentioned grace. Grace is a, is a term that, um, that we throw around quite often in the church. Uh, it's sometimes difficult for us to, to really define what grace is. Now, I've heard um, several different definitions for grace. I've heard that grace is God's unmerited favor, and I believe that that's true. Um, grace is getting what we do not deserve. Justice is getting what we do deserve, and mercy is, is, get, is, is not getting what we deserve. So grace is getting what we don't deserve. I've heard grace described this way, God's riches at Christ's expense. I'm not sure that any of those definitions are adequate to e explain grace. I do know this, that though we can't explain it, we can't experience it. In fact, we need to experience it. And without the grace of God, where would we be today? Um, we all stand in need of the grace of God. doesn't matter where you are, where you've been, what you've done. We all need the grace of God. And so t tonight, I want to help us to maybe go away from this place tonight, um, experiencing more of the grace of of God for our lives. I know this, that when I got up this morning, I was greeted by grace. And when I go to sleep tonight, grace will keep me. The grace of God that attends our lives from the first breath to the last breath that we breathe in life. I think that's why John Newton, the writer of that great, amazing, that great hymn, Amazing Grace, could say, Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. We need the grace of God. There's no situation too difficult. There's no situation too scary. There's no situation that is impossible for God when we appropriate the grace of God for our lives. I believe tonight that God's grace is greater than anything that we face. Now Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18 to give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I've got to confess to you, I'm not there yet. But he says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. God's grace is greater than the circumstances of my life. We all face circumstances. Circumstances are the things that surround us, the things that we face, the things that we encounter in life. That word circumstance actually comes from um, a similar root word as um, circumference. So I want you to imagine tonight that, that you're in a, in a huge circle. That, that circumference contains for, for us, for you and for me, circumstances, circumstances that sometimes can be overwhelming, circumstances that can appear to us to be impossible. We all face some circumstances in life, and sometimes we allow the circumstances of life to dictate our joy and to determine our victory and to rob us of what it is that God has for us as his people. 
We sometimes, we sometimes think that if the circumstances of life would change, we could be happy. So we set up this if-then scenario. If I just had a better job that paid more money, then I'd be happy. If I just had a better car than my neighbor has, then I could shine it up and, and be proud of the fact that, that I've got more than the Joneses. If my spouse was just a little bit more caring, then I could be happy in the relationship. So whatever the if-then is, this happiness illusion, we all face that in life. It's the circumstances. And yet, I'm here to tell you tonight that God's grace is greater than the circumstances that we face. Our happiness, our joy, our victory in the Christian life doesn't have to be dictated by the circumstances that we face. It's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances. He didn't say to give thanks for all circumstances, but he did say to give thanks for all, in all cir circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. God's grace is greater than our circumstances. You say, well, Paul just didn't live in my circumstance. And yet Paul could say in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, these words. Second Corinthians, the 11th chapter. He says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the presence of the pressure of my concern for all the churches. I don't know about you, but when I read that list, I come to the conclusion that maybe Paul knew what he was talking about. He, he hadn't been stoned one time too many. He, he knew with assurance that the grace of God was greater than any circumstance that he might face in life. And if that was true for Paul, I believe it's true for us. Because I haven't been shipwrecked, and I haven't been stoned, and I haven't been in, in perilous danger in some of the circumstances that Paul was. And if the grace of God was sufficient for Paul, and God is no respecter of persons, I believe the grace of God is sufficient for me. God's grace is greater than our circumstances. Here's what sometimes happens. And my, my wife tells me that I ought to think of these things earlier, and I wish that I could. Sometimes it's under the pressure that I get really creative. So I, I, I came up with this thought, this, this illustration. I just couldn't find um, what I wanted to illustrate it with. So you're going to have to use your imagination tonight, okay? Uh, imagine the scales of justice, okay? Got, got that picture? The scales of justice, all right? Over on this side are the circumstances of life. Let, let, let's just have some interaction. Let, let's uh, have an interactive sermon. What are some of the circumstances of life that, that we face? Maybe some circumstances that you face. Sickness. Okay. Death of a loved one. 
debt, okay? Taxes. What are some other circumstances over on this side of the room? Okay, struggle with relationships. That was a good message this morning, wasn't it? I, I needed it. What are some other circumstances? Okay, losing a job. Loneliness. Yeah, the, the list could go on and on. And when we pile these circumstances on this side of the scale, it's weighted, isn't it? But Paul says that we ought to take the circumstances of our lives and, and put on the other side of the scale the grace of God. And when we do that, we begin to realize that the grace of God is weightier than the circumstances of our lives. In fact, this is what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says in verse 8, 2 Corinthians 4, 8, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us up with Jesus and present us with and present us with you to himself all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God therefore we do not lose heart one of my favorite verses is, is Galatians 6.9. Galatians 6.9 reminds us, Weary not in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap a harvest if you do not faint. Paul says, do not lose heart. In spite of your circumstances, don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Our circumstances sometimes cause us to be upside down. But when we apply the grace of God, they more than outweigh our temporary our momentary trials. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul says, in the midst of your circumstances, realize that the grace of God is greater now, I don't know about you but there are times in my life when I really need that there are times when I need to be reminded that regardless of what I'm going through when I allow the grace of God to work in my life God's grace more than outweighs the temporary troubles that I encounter in life What happens when we fail to experience the grace of God? Well, I believe the writer of Hebrews helps us there. Well, over in the 12th chapter of, of Hebrews and the 15th verse, 
The writer says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. One translation says that we don't miss the grace of God and that no root of bitterness grows up to cause trouble and defile many. A, a bitter root in the Hebrew culture was a poisonous plant. The writer of Hebrews says, if we miss the grace of God, what is inevitable is that there'll be a poisonous plant that begins to grow in our hearts. And poisonous plants, when eaten, are deadly. I've known some people across the years that somewhere along the line they missed the grace of God and the result was a poisonous and deadly life. I believe God wants a church and a group of people that are filled with his grace. Pastor mentioned this morning about what would define us or describe us as a church and there's a long list of things that, that might um, describe who we are, what we're known by. I hope in addition to all those things that we're also known as a people of grace. The world will beat us up. The world will tear us down. We need to be a part of a fellowship that's full of grace. A grace that is greater than the circumstances of our existence. Don't miss the grace of God. Johann LaRue tells about being invited by the director of Love in Action to one of their meetings. Love in Action is, a, is an organization that, that ministers to men in particular who are struggling with life issues. And so LaRue went to the meeting one night and, and during the course of the meeting, one man got up and, and, and came before the group and began to share some of the some of the struggles that he had in life and some of the sins that he was, was, um, was struggling with. And as he began to speak, um, the, the hand of another man in the, in the crowd shot up. And the Rue thought, well, he, he's going he's gonna to stop and ask the man what the question is. But he just went on. As he continued to share some of life's issues and struggles, there's another couple of hands in the congregation in that crowd that, that went up. And after the meeting was over, the director asked LaRue, well, what did you think about the meeting? He said, well, it, it was good. It was, it was all right. But, but I've got a question. During the course of, of that man sharing, there were, there were several hands that went up, questions that no doubt needed to be asked and answered. And, and the director of Love in Action smiled and said, oh, they, they weren't raising their hand to ask questions. You, you see, it's a, it's a rule for Love in Action that when... When a person speaks about some of life's issues that they're struggling with, if there's somebody in the crowd that night that has struggled with or is struggling with the same issue, they, they will raise their hand because we don't want anyone to be alone. Sometimes in the church, we're much better at pointing fingers than we are raising hands. And God wants to help us understand that we all struggle in life. Your struggles may not be what my struggles are, but we've all got struggles. And it's helpful to know that in the midst of our struggles, we're not alone. And we need to remind ourselves that regardless of the struggle, God's grace is greater than our circumstances. The grace of God is greater than your circumference. 
what you're surrounded by and what you're struggling with. And when we understand that, I think we can agree with Paul that we're to give thanks in all circumstances. For even this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now this week, I'm going to need to experience the grace of God. Am I alone? Are there some hands that could go up and say, I, I'm going to need to experience God's grace? Well, I, I hope we all know tonight that whatever it is that we'll face this week and in the weeks to come, that God's grace is greater than our circumstances. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for reminding me that in the midst of things that I don't always understand, and in the midst of things that I don't really want to have to go through, that your grace is more than enough. It's greater than any circumstance that I may face, any situation I may encounter, regardless of how frightening it may be or impossible it may seem. God, I, I don't want to miss the grace of God because I know that when I do, I'll turn bitter. And I pray that as a people, we would open our lives fully to the grace that you want to bring that will enable us and empower us to be more than adequate to face the challenges and the circumstances and the situations that life brings our way. So God, whatever is within our circumference tonight, remind us that your grace is greater than whatever it may be. Send us out of this place tonight to be grace-filled people that will express and experience that grace in a way that will bring glory and honor to your name is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for watching today online. It has been our privilege to share this time with you. I'm Pastor Terry Armstrong, and I want you to know that if we can do anything to assist you, any words that you would like to say, any comments that you would like to make, or anything that you would like to tell us about what God is doing in your life, please do not hesitate to give us a call. Our number is 405 376 2892, or you can email me directly at terry at mustangnaz.org. Again, we just hope that today your spirit, your heart has been encouraged by the presence of God. And so now I just want to say to you, may the peace of our Lord and Savior reign and rule, and may He give you His calmness in the midst of your storms. In Christ's name we pray these things for you. Amen and amen.